I am delighted to welcome you tonight to the third annual awarding of the George Hunt Prize for Excellence in Journalism, Arts, and Letters. This initi initiative is jointly sponsored by America Media and St. Thomas More, the Catholic Chapel and Center at Yale University, and we are delighted with this initiative. Uh, we, have, we at St. Thomas More have enjoyed the collaboration with America Magazine, and we are excited by this initiative and very grateful to Faye Vincent for being the in original inspiration with this idea. Faye's a member of our Board of Trustees. He's with us on li live stream tonight. He's very much with us in spirit. So welcome, Faye, and welcome, welcome to you all. Uh, we're very, very grateful for this evening. We've done it twice on campus at St. Thomas More. This is our first time doing it here in the city. And, and without uh, any further delay, I'll invite Father Matt Malone, the editor of America Magazine, to come forward and begin our program. Our boss. Good evening, uh, my brothers and sisters, and uh, welcome to this very special evening. Uh, my thanks to uh, Father Bob Boulogne and his team uh, for all that they've done to make this partnership such a success. All of us at America Media and uh, the St. Thomas More Chapel and Center at Yale are really delighted to gather here, uh, as we have for the last three years, for such an occasion to honor uh, a legacy, a legacy of journalistic integrity, a passionate pursuit of the truth, and a never-ending curiosity that stretched from the works of Cheever and Updike to the latest artistic trends, to serious matters of politics and crisis throughout the world, and of course, the quieter moments of faith and hope. And this was the legacy, and is the legacy, of Father George W. Hunt, SJ, the longest tenured editor-in-chief of America Magazine. George's love of the written word and concern for a balance of voices in the pages of America were his hallmark. He never sacrificed quality. The only thing closer to George's heart than the written word were the many friendships that he made throughout his life. And it is through one of those friendships with Faye Vincent, as Bob mentioned, that this prize came into being. And we thank him for his leadership in seeing this occasion through. It is with all of this in mind that we seek to honor the legacy of Father Hunt really in the best way that we can with the George W. Hunt SJ Prize for Excellence in Journalism, Arts, and Letters, a $25,000 prize awarded to the most promising and productive members of the literary world who capture the Catholic imagination. This year, the Hunt Prize goes to a novelist. This novelist, born in Los Angeles and a graduate of Yale University, Georgetown, and George Mason, serves as an associate professor of English at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. He is also currently a member of the faculty of the Warren Wilson MFA program for writers in North Carolina. His numerous publications include the upcoming novel, Paris by the Book, Listen and Other Stories, All Saints, and The Cloud Atlas. Among other places, his writing has appeared in the New York Times Book Review, Commonweal, The Washington Post Magazine, The Wall Street Journal, The Writer's Chronicle, The New York Times, The Washington Post, Esquire, The New Haven Review, and soon the cover of America. He is a recipient of numerous accolades, including the Henry P. Wright Memorial Creative Nonfiction Prize, the designation of Peter Taylor Fellow, and inclusion in the Million Writers Award Notable Stories of 2011. This is an individual who, as one of his nominators wrote, is one of the few young American fiction writers I regard as a worthy successor to an extraordinary mid-20th century trio of American Catholic writers, J.F. Powers, Flannery O'Connor, and Walker Percy, a group that might be expanded to a quartet with the inclusion of Muriel Spark, a sly writer, one who beckons his readers 
into the narrative doorway with smiling, welcome prose, and then clobbers them with the frying pan of his concerns. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that I speak for Father Boulogne and myself when I say it is a great honor on behalf of the boards of trustees of America Media and the St. Thomas More Chapel and Center at Yale University to welcome uh, Liam Callanan to this evening and to also welcome his family, uh, his wife Susan, his father Charles, his mother Joan, and his sister Erin. It's really wonderful to have you with us. Before the uh, formal presentation, I would invite you to uh, take your seats and to see a brief uh, film produced by the America Films Division uh, under the direction of Father Jeremy Zippel. I guess I'll just read part of it. We'll see how it goes. The old nun, Agnes, who keeps to herself, the old nun's friend, Frida, because even old nuns who keep to themselves keep at least one friend, and that's who Frida is. And why not? Because she too is an old nun, but also a former one, and was happy to drive over this fine summer evening and help Agnes root around the front yard, looking for Joseph, who's not a nun, but a saint, or its plastic replica, buried upside down somewhere here in front of the convent. The two old women are sure of it because the building is for sale, and tradition holds that this is what you do. Hire the realtor, plant the sign, bury the statue, hello buyer. Is that smoke? I think early on I had this simplistic view that a Catholic writer was like J.F. Powers. I better make sure I people my cast with a lot of priests. And so I wrote a lot about priests early on. I don't have as many priests as protagonists recently, but I think my work has been getting progressively more Catholic over time. I think in part because I become so interested in the notion of grace and what it means when people, it lies just out of their reach and what it means for people who have fallen to try and seek it. And I realize that's something, of course, that I'm trying to seek in my own life. And suddenly I realize that me being a Catholic writer is about everything I do, not just the people or the how I put it on the page, but where the ideas come from. This is a collection of stories that uh, the title story is called Listen, but in some ways that's the theme of the whole collection, trying to find out what it means to really listen to one another. There's a lot of characters in this collection who can't hear one another for a variety of reasons, because they don't want to, uh, because they physically can't, because they're dead and gone and the character can't really access what's there, or I think more importantly because they have a faulty sense of belief. One of the things I'm constantly interested in interrogating in my own work is what does it mean to believe? And I feel like the muscle that generates belief is something that you can kind of practice amongst each other before you even get to those higher realms of religious faith. But it's a profound sense of these characters trying to believe in each other and believing in things that they can't see. I once had a creative writing instructor tell me that you could never have more than three characters in a story. More than three, you need a novel. It's kind of a, an homage to him, and then the notion of Twitter, I tried to see if I could stuff 140 characters into a piece. And the way the narrative flowed, I realized like I needed all those 140 characters to tell the story, which is of this kind of decaying convent and these nuns who rally around their community, which is not necessarily Milwaukee, not necessarily any other urban place, but a place where people are trying to find and locate their faith in a very physical way, which I think is being lost in a lot of the inner cities. And it takes more than one person to get that started, and it takes more than like two or three people to get that rebirth started. It may in fact take 140. Uh, so this is from 140 characters, and I think we're going to get through about 27 at this point. Suzanne, who doesn't go to church nowadays, Sundays are for open houses, but happily retweets the odd biblical passage she comes across and keeps a trunk full of St. Joseph's rattling around in her car to give to clients. Hey, you never know. Her clients, the nuns, specifically Mary Pat and Mary Grace, two of the three women remaining at the convent in the inner city, who are sitting inside wondering when Agnes, the third, is going to come back from that walk she claims she was taking. What that high-pitched sound is, it's the smoke detector, ladies. There's a fire, a fire. I did not realize until we were blessed what an amazing gift parenting would be. They've transformed my life, and they just make me wonder at all the gifts we've been given. The principal of my high school at Loyola, Gordon Bennett, 
uh, was later ordained a bishop. And in his Episcopal ordination, he discussed his motto, which was grace upon grace. I'm not a theologian, but I just understood this constant flowing of grace from God. And I have to admit that I didn't even fully understand that concept until we were blessed with children. And I understood this is where grace funnels through. And so it's the reason that we actually, our first daughter is named Mary Grace. Sometimes I realize that uh, as I go on, all my stories are about parenting, either trying to get in touch with your kids or trying to get in touch with yourself as a parent and what happens when those kind of fault lines break down. But I think in that sense then all my stories are about grace, either seeking it or being so surprised that you have it. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Boards of Trustees of America Media and the St. Thomas More Chapel and Center at Yale University, it is the pleasure of both myself and Father Boulogne to award the 2017 George W. Hunt S.J. Prize for Excellence in Journalism, Arts, and Letters to Liam R. Callanan. This is your moment. <laughs> I, had, I had watched the previous uh, Hunt Prize presentations, and I couldn't understand, despite it being such a happy occasion, why the recipients were often moved to tears. And now I do. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm humbled and grateful. And though it's been roughly three months since Father Malone called me on the feast of St. Thomas More, I am still overfilled with awe. I want to thank, and light too. <laughs> Yale University is going to make it now that the light bill's been paid. I want to thank, I want to thank St. Thomas More Chapel and Center at Yale University and America Media. I want to thank Father Boulogne and Father Malone. I also want to thank Father Jeremy Zippel and Jose Dueño for that incredible film. Thank you very much. Um, Uh, I want to thank uh, Nick Sawicki. I understand he was part of the reason uh, or part of the effort to move this down to New York to uh, kind of get more attendance. And when I asked him how that was going, he said, have you seen how crowded this town is? <laughs> I also want to thank, I understand there's a little rivalry between Catholic magazines, but I do want to thank, uh, and she's here tonight uh, from Commonweal, Molly Wilson O'Reilly, uh, one of my champions, and Professor Valerie Sayers of Notre Dame for their help. And for many years ago, the earlier help at Loyola High School in Los Angeles, my senior year English teacher, Miss Sylvia Rousseff, and as you saw on screen, uh, Father, now Bishop, Gordon Bennett. Lastly, I want to thank my daughters, uh, Mary, Honor, and Jane, back home, watching, I believe, uh, during the soccer carpool on live stream. Thank you again to Father Zippel. I want to thank my folks. My sister Erin, my brother Brian, my beautiful wife Susan, who 20 years ago this season, when I came home from work one day and I said, do you remember that great plan we had about me quitting my job, perfectly good job, and coming home to write the great American novel? And she said, let's do it. Thank you, Susan. Uh, I need to do a quick preface before the talk. This talk tonight is on fiction and truth, but I want to preface that with some truth, which is that I am in that phase of parenthood, as you might have seen, where I spend as much time driving to sports as I do writing. Uh, I am my daughter's number one fan. Uh, and sometimes I get that fandom wrong, as I did for many years, uh, early years with my daughter, Honor, who you saw on screen there. She's our middle child, H. O-N-O-R, and she is named for our great-great-aunt, Honor, who emigrated from Ireland. 
For years, I stood on sidelines yelling encouragement and advice to Honor, such as when teammates would not pass her the ball. Honor! I would yell. For the love of God, play with honor! <laughs> it was only much later I realized that opposing teams did not know that I was yelling her name. So other people sometimes now join me yelling, glory, respect. <laughs> but now I am much more positive, and so when one of my daughters does something truly great, a goal, a spike, a home run, I will yell, that's great parenting. <laughs> that is a joke, but this is not. The only reason I stand before you today is because of two people who traveled here all the way from Los Angeles to be here tonight and who have cheered me ceaselessly since I was younger than Honor is now, who have told me whenever I fell as a child, as a parent, to pick myself up and keep running home. That's great parenting. And you don't need to shout it tonight, but I would hope that you would join me in recognizing my parents, my mom and dad. All right, Nick tells me we have the room until 10, so I've looked. I have roughly that much material uh, arranged for you. The topic tonight is, and the title, The Fiction of Truth and the Truth of Fiction. I once wrote a novel, The Cloud Atlas, about a priest who lived in Bethel, Alaska, a tundra town 390 roadless miles west of Anchorage. The Jesuits have a parish there, Immaculate Conception, but I didn't want any confusion that my protagonist was wholly fictional, so I invented a parish for him. I did name him Lewis because I'd had an elderly cousin who'd been a Trappist monk at Gethsemane with Thomas Merton. My cousin's monastic name was Kevin. Merton's, of course, was Lewis. The monastery's bells rang bright and clear through my every memory of visiting Gethsemane, so I tried that as my character's last name, Bell. But it was too sweet for a character who was not. I searched consonants to make the name more discordant. Bell became Belk. And Lewis Belk, in my novel, became a man who, long before his ordination, spent World War II as a staff sergeant in the Army Air Corps, charged with cleaning up a specific type of bomb, one that the Japanese floated across the Pacific towards the end of the war on paper balloons. I did not invent the balloons nor the fact that one of these balloons landed near Bethel, Alaska, nor that at the crash site, investigators found something quite unusual in the wreckage, a postcard written in a boyish hand, Japanese, to his father. There was no record of the message. Also true, at the time of writing this novel, I had just quit a career as a different sort of writer, public relations, corporate communications. And in the wake of a personal tragedy, I decided that I needed to pursue a life with more meaning. And that meant I had to get this novel absolutely right. I interviewed historians. I asked a bomb disposal veteran to review my manuscript. He said that I had gotten most of the bomb details right, but that I should not have the characters take the Lord's name in vain. <laughs> I took his advice. I took everyone's advice. But just days after the novel was published, I received an email from a man upset that I had not consulted him. He, like my protagonist, was a World War II veteran. He, like my protagonist, had been in the Army Air Corps. Like my protagonist, a staff sergeant, knew plenty about bombs. And he, like my protagonist, was named Louis Belk. He was very startled to see <laughs> his name come up in reviews of my book, which appeared to be about him, but was definitely not. And he was not mollified by my reply, which borrowed from the copyright page any resemblance to persons living or dead. <laughs> Don't you want to know, he said, the truth? I do not. And I do. And what I want to do tonight is explore how and when and why writers choose fiction to find truth. It's not that I don't believe in nonfiction, quite the opposite. Essays, articles, histories, discoveries, good nonfiction teaches us what to believe. But it is fiction that teaches us to believe. 
I'm not the first down this path. In fact, 86 years ago, just yesterday, two men making their way down a path in Oxford named Addison's Walk circled a similar argument, C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien. Lewis, a theist then, could not accept, let alone separate, the story of Jesus' death and resurrection from any of a dozen other myths that had a young God dying only to be reborn. Myths are lies, Lewis reportedly said, even though breathed through silver. Tolkien pressed on. Myths contain truths, he said. But in Christ's story, Christ's story is the truth. Lewis listened carefully. His friend had stirred something in him, and in the weather, most accounts of the evening cite a sudden breeze. And days later, after a motorcycle sidecar ride to a new zoo, C.S. Lewis realized he believed in Jesus. This account fascinates me. Among other things, I love that sudden breeze, that sidecar, and Tolkien's, and I love the fact that Tolkien's most celebrated biographer, Hugo Carpenter, bases his account of this famous conversation not on a recording or a stenographer's notes, but a poem that Tolkien later wrote. I believe every word of it, the poem, the biography, the story, even Tolkien's taxonomy of myth. But what I believe in most is Tolkien's focus on the power of a story to reach people, to move people, even, as was the case here, to convert them. I teach creative writing. The first thing I disabuse students of is that this is unserious work. It is work. It has consequences. The chief one being that when done well, it connects two people, writer and reader, with truths that lie outside them both. I want to be careful with this word truth, in part because the word feels more imperiled than ever, and in part because I want to avoid the trap Flannery O'Connor laid out in an essay, The Church and the Fiction Writer, that appeared in America in 1957. She writes, it is generally supposed, and not least by Catholics, that the Catholic who writes fiction is out to use fiction to prove the truth of the faith, or at least to prove the existence of the supernatural. But, she adds, what the fiction writer will discover is that he himself cannot move or mold reality in the interests of abstract truth. Fiction can transcend its limitations only by staying within them. With this in mind, I want to take a close look at how two contemporary authors, one old, one young, transcend those limitations, and in doing so, find truths that are not only abstract, but powerfully concrete. Winner of, among other prizes, the National Book Foundation's 535 Award, Kirsten Valdez Quaid published her first collection of stories, Night at the Fiestas, in 2015. I count O'Connor and Valdez Quaid as kindred spirits, both write vivid, real, human stories. And because that re reality is sometimes grotesque, both of them sometimes disquiet readers as a result. Again, here's O'Connor in 1957 in the pages of America Magazine. If we intend to encourage Catholic fiction writers, we must convince those coming along that the church does not restrict their freedom to be artists, but ensures it. And to convince them of this requires, perhaps more than anything else, a body of Catholic readers. Now here is a reader, a newspaper reporter in 2015, interviewing Valdez Quaid. Are you an apostate? I doubt O'Connor would count it as progress that six decades on, this question was being asked by a secular arts entertainment weekly. If anything, O'Connor might have been surprised how temperate Valdez Quaid was in her reply. I don't count myself as an apostate at all. I'm a Catholic, although my relationship with Catholicism isn't uncomplicated. She then mentioned her grandmother, a longtime member of the Altar Society at Santa Fe's Cathedral, and recalled being allowed to, quote, accompany her onto the altar and into the sacristy, those places that felt both important and forbidden. Such places and such intimacies abound in Valdez Quaid's work. Grace is often just out of reach of her characters, but only ever just out of reach. If only this cousin or that sister or the pregnant teenager who shows up at Lent during exactly the wrong time, if only they did the right thing or had the right thing done for them, if only they could see clearly the truth, things might just work out. They might just be saved. It's a testament to Valdez Quaid's skill that engaged readers do come to see the truth even as her characters do not. Here's one character, I loved Christina, I did, a character says in one of her stories about her sister, I see this now. 
But what readers see is the overeager emphasis undermining the assertion. What does she see? Quite a lot, this character. It turns out, as this line comes from a startling Valdez Quaid story, Christina the Astonishing, published just months ago on the 763rd birthday of the actual Christina the Astonishing, a Belgian woman born in 1150, never formally canonized but celebrated as a folk saint for centuries. By all accounts, Christina led an enormously difficult life, and in doing so made life enormously difficult for others. Modern medicine might diagnose her with epilepsy, Tourette's, anorexia. Valdez Quaid's story offers substantial grounds for doing so. But the story also makes room in the reader's mind for the possibility that Christina's life and works really were miraculous. It does so daringly by interrogating the nature of belief itself. Starting with the believer who narrates the story, this is Mara, Christina's older sister, the one who earlier insisted that she loved her sister, that she sees this now. But she says this from the pews at Christina's funeral, moments before the Agnus Dei is interrupted by the body of her dead sister rising up into the rafters. Down below, Mara asks how to make sense of this. The young woman up there in the rafters is no apparition. Christina was dead, and now she's alive, eyes shocked and glittering. Christina grips the beam, her long fingers pressed so hard against the wood, splintered and rough with ads marks, that afterwards they will be bloody. What makes this account seem so real, so true, is not its emphasis on the supernatural, that flight into the rafters, but rather its relentless focus once again on the physical, those bloody fingers, the wood rough with ads marks. The result is that even though Valdez Quaid uses a 13th century hagiographer's interstitial titles in her own account, how she was led forth from the body and how she lived again, how she expounded with the spirit of prophecy, and so on, by the end of the story, it comes to feel that the medieval scribe has borrowed from the 21st century author and not the other way around. Discussing this story, Valdez Quaid told an interviewer, human progress is the result of our need to understand and explain the mysteries of the world around us. However, I wanted to complicate the flat narrative of Her Holiness without undercutting it. After all, who am I to say whether Christina talked to God? What I do know, Valdez Quaid says, about the sources of insight and grace in my story, Christina Flies. Ron Hansen, novelist, deacon, Gerard Manley Hopkins professor in the arts and humanities at Santa Clara, once had, like Valdez Quaid, a difficult interview question put to him. The subject was not apostasy, but something trickier, Catholic fiction. He was asked to define it. Before concluding that it was a slippery category and probably more functional in the classroom than in criticism, he said this, perhaps what finally distinguishes a Catholic fiction writer from all the others is the yes and rather than the yes but approach to their subjects. Perhaps because of our experience of the sacrament of reconciliation, we can see good and evil existing side by side within the same person. We can see our tendencies toward meanness and sin just as tangents or interruptions to our striving for holiness and perfection. I see this yes and in Valdez Quaid, and as Hansen later points out, you see it in many authors, regardless of religion. And though it took some time and much reflection, I eventually saw it in me. In 1986, I stood graveside in a strange cemetery I thought I would never see again. The dead, many Irish, all Catholic, are familiar, but what they are doing is not. Beneath the soil, one of the deceased smokes, quote, roots of grass that died in the periodic droughts afflicting the cemetery. Next to him, his wife, quote, reaves crosses from the dead dandelions and other deep-rooted weeds. These words are not mine, but William Kennedy's, and they come from his 1983 Pulitzer Prize-winning novel, Ironweed, which opens in St. Agnes Cemetery in Albany, New York. It's his book that's transported me, at least fictionally, a high school senior in wise, brave Miss Sylvia Rousseff's class at Loyola High School in late 1980s Los Angeles to stand, to imagine I was standing, alongside Francis Phelan in late 1930s Albany as he peers down at the grave of his infant son, Gerald, who died after Francis accidentally dropped him. I am not really there. I am there. 
As we did for Christina the Astonishing, let us hold both as true for now, because this is what fiction does, and sometimes not euphemistically, it moves you. Francis will spend the next three days in the novel wandering Albany, with one misadventure after another among Albany's down and out. The story is gritty and emphatically real, except when it's not, as in these opening pages when Kennedy describes the dead in their graves as animated, if evanescent souls, who can smoke roots and weave crosses underground and witness the arrival of human flotsam like Francis Phelan. This was nothing like I'd ever read in English class. The supernatural and the real presented seamlessly without pretense or pretext. Kennedy was not the first author to do this, but he was the first to do it for me. His fiction, in short, made me believe. In Francis, in those fidgety dead parents, and most significantly in the novel's later claim that though Francis's infant son Gerald had in life, quote, only monosyllabic goos and gauze in his vocabulary, he possessed the gift of tongues and death. Gerald understands understands the chattery squirrels, the slithy semaphores of slugs and worms, Kennedy writes, and he tries very hard to communicate with his wayward father, attempting to impose on him, quote, the pressing obligation to perform his final acts of expiation for abandoning the family. You will not know, the child silently said, what these acts are until you have performed them all, and then when these final acts are complete, you will stop trying to die because of me. Does Francis hear him? Kennedy doesn't say. I know I did. I heard Gerald and Francis and Kennedy besides, and I heard here what fiction could do does, which is erase boundaries, merry minds, trouble feeling into flame. I wanted to be a writer then. I wanted to do that for someone else. I wanted to conjure fictional lives that were wholly real. But I also wanted to know what happened at the end of the novel. It's ambiguous. The novel has followed Francis on a roundabout journey of redemption. But when the key moment arrives, Kennedy suddenly switches gears and verb tenses, leaving a naive 17-year-old like the one I was wondering what was true. So I did what Sergeant Belk would do later decades. With Mrs. Rousseff's bemused encouragement, I wrote the author. Don't you want to know the truth? Sergeant Belk asked, and his asking was just one more coincidence. Seeking the truth was what drove my protagonist, my Sergeant Belk, on his journey through the novel. What had really happened on the tundra so many years ago? Where had that postcard come from? How had that affected him ever since? Who was he now? Sergeant Belk found me, but I wonder if he ever thought of it another way that my book had found him, and Kennedy's found me. He didn't say. I offered to send Sergeant Belk a copy of my novel. It went unclaimed. The letter was short, typed on stationery without a return address. I showed it to Miss Rousseff, and she was stunned. A letter from William Kennedy to a 17-year-old student at Loyola High School. The tone was warm, but also firm. He thanked me for my letter, my thoughts on Francis, on redemption. And then he said, the truth is, I can't tell you how it ends. Thirty-one years later, I can. I can tell you a story of standing amid tombstones in an ancient Catholic cemetery above an infant's grave. This is no longer Kennedy's story, but mine. We're not in Albany, but in Washington, D.C. The cemetery is not St. Agnes, but Mount Olivet. The baby's name is not Gerald, but Lucy. She died just before she was born, just days before she was due. No one ever dropped her. On the contrary, as afternoon darkened into night, we held her until we couldn't any longer. And soon after, I changed my life because I could no longer do the work I had been doing I needed to write the truth. What I understood of William Kennedy, of fiction, when I was the age of my students, what is it was magic, fun. As for truth, I put my faith in nonfiction. What I know now is that the root of the word fiction is to make, and what fiction makes is life, and should we so believe the next life. I have written about swimmers searching for a friend in a flooded town, about a hunter searching for a bear a scout wants to save, 
about a family searching for their father in Paris, about 140 characters searching for a way to save a convent, about a real boy who attached a postcard to a balloon at the end of World War II and sent it sailing because he knew of no other way to reach his long lost father, only that words would take him there. What I mean is this, I know that child, I know that father, now you do too. The truth, fiction moves us, engages us, finds for us truths we may not have recognized when first presented to us as fact. Fiction teaches us agility, the importance of leaping from word to meaning and the pleasure that's to be had in doing so. Fiction teaches us empathy with characters whose lives lie far beyond our own or are so eerily similar they feel identical. With a sister ill or prophetic or both clawing at the rafters, with an infant who never got a chance to speak in life, but in death now speaks with such eloquence, a father believes he can hear the voice even though it is inaudible. Listen, the voice says, believe. Thank you. Thanks very much for a wonderful presentation that we all found very inspiring. I appreciate it. Good stock, see? Good support and good stock. Uh, there are copies of the, the Cloud Atlas on the back table. Those who wish to purchase one are invited to do so. And then come down the center aisle, and Liam will be inscribing them over here at this table. So for those leaving, please leave on the side aisles and leave the center aisle for those coming forward for autographing. Thank you all for being here. Again, congratulations. Good night.